Here's something you don't hear every day. A St. Louis-based company that's not moving out of town, not being bought by somebody else, not changing its name. In fact, Brown Shoe Company recently announced not only that it was keeping its headquarters here, but that it was expanding. Of course, the shoe business has played an important role in St. Louis history. And a few years ago, we did a story at Brown Shoe when they were celebrating an anniversary. An anniversary of one of the best deals they ever made. That's my dog, Tide. He lives in a shoe. I'm Buster Brown. Look for me in there, too. Buster Brown and Tige have been living in shoes now for more than a hundred years. Such longevity and continued success of a single brand name is really quite remarkable in the modern business world. In fact, the way children's shoes came to be made and sold and marketed is pretty much the story of Buster Brown, who doesn't really live in a shoe. He lives in Clayton, the headquarters of the Brown Shoe Company. Today, the company is 130 years old and includes Naturalizer, Lifestride, and Connie brands. But Buster Brown is still a big seller. When that brand turned 100 in 2004, Brown Shoes Archivist was just digging into its rich and colorful history. When I first saw the collection of the Brown Shoe Company, um, I had been trying to find other companies' histories and none existed. So first of all, I was excited that a company had save stuff. And then when I started pulling things out, the richness of it was, was really overwhelming and it, it was like Christmas. There are really two histories here. Brown Shoe, the company which goes back to its founding in St. Louis in 1878, and Buster Brown, the cartoon character who first appeared in newspapers in 1902. A mischievous little kid whose fancy rich boy clothes often ended up tattered from his many adventures. And he's the first comic strip character. He's syndicated nationally. So he's the first Charlie Brown or Bart Simpson. And he certainly was of that caliber. And his, his creator, uh, Richard Alcott, was a very good marketer. And right away he started licensing the rides to Buster Brown. So you had everything from Buster Brown cigars. Um, this is one of my favorite artifacts here. Um, clearly, this wasn't just for, chi I mean, the, the character wasn't just for children. So we got Buster Brown. Brown Shoe cigars. was just one of the many companies that purchased the rights to use the cartoon character. The original contract hasn't been found, but company legend says it was a one time payment of just $200 for the use of Buster and Tig. That was in late 1903, just in time for the company to introduce its new brand of shoes on the world's biggest stage. Like a lot of companies, Brown Shoe invested quite a lot in promoting itself at the 1904 World's Fair. It set up a whole factory in the Palace of Manufacturing and introduced its new Buster Brown brand of children's shoes. But it didn't stop there. The company hired a circus midget by the name of Major Ray to portray Buster, along with a trained dog in the part of Tig. Before this, children's shoes were pretty much just shoes. Now, they became something called Buster Browns. Really nobody was using what we would call maybe a spokesman today uh, and that was one of the genius of what Brown did with it. They took Buster Brown and they used him as his spokes character and, and so this is the first time that you've got children's shoes with a popular character that's recognizable that's going to be marketed that way. And how effective was it? It was phenomenal. In fact, the company uh, started adding factories um, in 1905 and 1906 and 1907. It was just phenomenal. After the World's Fair and into the 30s, the company was sending busters and tigs out on the road for personal appearances at small town shoe stores. Kids would recite a pledge of loyalty to Buster Brown shoes and walked away with a free gift, a clicker, or a whistle. This, too, was something pioneered by the shoe company. Free stuff, a gift with purchase. If Brown Shoe Company didn't invent this, they made it into an art form. That when you got your shoes, you got a gift with purchase. One of the first um, gifts were, were watches, and um, where they made the deal at the World's Fair. And 
in this case, what you would do is you had to spend $15 uh, and the merchant would keep track of it. And once you spent $15, you got a Buster Brown watch. Uh, and then if you were willing to spend 50 cents more, you could get... That's brilliant, because you got to come back a few times to run up a $15 bill back then. You yeah. betcha, because these shoes are 2 $3, yeah. And then you get the watch bob uh, if you spend an extra 50 cents. In a silent movie era, Buster Brown advertising slides were projected on the screen between films. The company was one of the first sponsors on early radio, and then after the war, jumped right onto television. Now kids, I want you to see this new Buster Brown comic book number 25. Buster yeah. Brown was huge with baby boomers, first with a show hosted by Smile and Ed McConnell, and then with Andy Devine on Andy's Gang. Buster Browns are the only kind of shoes my gang will wear. It seems so obvious today, but Buster Brown was one of the first products that was marketed from the beginning to both parents and children. Of course, they still are. When, when you do market research for yes. kids' shoes, are you talking to the parents or are you talking to the kids? Actually, we do both. We talk to the moms a lot and the dads because we understand that they're the ones that are actually making the purchase. But we know from our market research that kids really start influencing the shoe process by the time they're three years old. So Buster Brown shoes have been around for a hundred years. Brown Shoe Company a lot longer than that. And yet in a city once known as being first in shoes, this company has a pretty low profile. Until they put that big shoe sculpture out front, a lot of people didn't even notice that this was the world headquarters. The company moved to Clayton from Washington Avenue in 1952 and this is not the first time Channel 9 has been here. Here we are at the outside of the Brown Shoe Company. This is the offices in Clayton. near. St. It was around 1960 when a children's show host, Sally Grayson, came to these same headquarters to show kids how shoes are made. is designing a shoe that's going to be for little girls. And there's a name they have for this shoe called the Pogo. And you're going to watch this. Shoes are still designed here. That hasn't changed, but it's all done on computer now. But first, they're going to make just one pair to see how they like In it. Sally Grayson's day, the design would be put in an envelope and sent off to a factory in Dixon, Missouri. Today, it is emailed to offices in China, where the prototype is made. And if St. Louis approves, it will then be mass-produced somewhere in the world. Isn't this a big factory? Almost all American shoes now are made somewhere overseas, and St. Louis is no longer the shoe capital it once was. But the Brown Shoe Company is still with us, and so is the Buster Brown brand. But even that has gone through a big change just recently. It was decided that the Buster and Tig we remember so well from the heels of our shoes would be, well, not replaced, but retired. The name is there, but... Buster and Tiger not there. Right. We have the name and we have a paw print mm -hmm. in the bottom of the shoe, which is symbolic of Tig. And then we use kids and dogs on all of our Buster Brown boxes and any marketing materials that we use in the stores. But the name is the same and the company's not going to change that. A hundred years after a St. Louis shoe company executive paid a cartoonist just a few hundred dollars, Buster Brown is still selling lots and lots of shoes. I'm Buster Brown. Look for me in there, too. It's a phenomenal name, and we would like to thank greatly anybody who was responsible for getting that name 100 years ago.